Thank you for tuning in to This Automation Life, brought to you by Brenner Fiedler. I'm your host, Jeremy Schubert. Each week, we discuss technologies used in automation. And this week, Dave Connaughton, nitrogen generator specialist, is here with me uh, to discuss nitrogen generators. And Dave, you've got a, a background going back over 20 years in nitrogen, uh, bachelor's in chemistry, and master's in chemical engineering. Um, I think you've got to know a little bit about this topic, huh? Yeah, I've been uh, uh, dealing with gas generators almost almost from the beginning. Um, uh, first with laboratory products, and now uh, you know scaling them up to industrial size uh, generators. Awesome. Uh, so, when we talk about a, a nitrogen generator, what is that, and what does it do? Well, the air that that uh, you're breathing right now is about seventy nine percent nitrogen and and twenty one percent oxygen. And really what a nitrogen generator does, it's like a specialized filter. It separates out the oxygen that's in the air and leaves nitrogen behind. And it starts off with compressed uh, nitrogen, typically around 100, 110 PSI, compressed air, I'm sorry, typically at 100 to 110 PSI. And uh, so it has to be pressurized air from a compressor. But after that, you can think of it as a specialized filter. The, uh, takes the molecules out and leaves the night takes the molecules of oxygen out leaves the nitrogen behind that's that's pretty cool so you could use i mean most places have shop air available so you could use your shop air we're going to make sure it's clean and dry i'm sure and then uh out of that you get nitrogen yeah is that i understand it right yeah it's pretty much plug and play uh air clean clean air in uh we do have pre-filtration um and then the uh, separation occurs, and we also have post-filtration to assure even to the level of sterility of the, uh, of the nitrogen. Wow. So if, you're, if you don't use a nitrogen generator, how are people getting nitrogen now? Right now, about even today, 97% of nitrogen uh, manufactured in this country comes from in the United States, comes from uh, cryogenic air separation. Okay. Uh, nitrogen by pound is either the number one or number two chemical produced in uh, in North America. Now, the uh, bulk of that nitrogen is used for making fertilizer, but a lot of it is turned into liquid and uh, delivered to sites for various uses, uh, 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 various uses of nitrogen. So um, I've seen like big big silos outside of companies. Sometimes these are liquid nitrogen and have smaller tanks inside. A lot of times this is, it could be their, their source of nitrogen right now. Right. The process to make, make it the reason they call it a cryogenic air separation plant is that they actually cool the air down to, uh, to the, um, uh, boiling point of nitrogen below the boiling point so that it, it condenses. And that's how you get nitrogen out of, out of air. But hmm. one of the things about the cryogenic uh, separation plants that is coming more and more to people's attention is that it creates a, a generating nitrogen and delivering nitrogen um, via truck creates a huge carbon footprint. You can imagine how much energy it takes to get air down to uh, minus 320. Wow. Uh, when you think the air conditioning in your house uses a lot of electricity. You can imagine what's going on in their sep plant. Yeah. And the truck alone, just by itself, produces 360,000 uh, uh, pounds of CO2 per year, you know, if it's traveling about 100,000 miles. So trucking this stuff around and, and uh, just the process of making it does create a, uh, a lot of uh, carbon dioxide and a huge carbon footprint. So you've got nitrogen. The, the carbon okay. footprint of the truck delivering the liquid nitrogen and then the carbon footprint of all the energy used to actually make liquid nitrogen out of the normal atmosphere air. Yeah. yeah whereas yeah. if you generate nitrogen on site, your only, your only energy input is from running your uh, compressor. Okay. So the comparison is quite favorable uh, uh, to, to make nitrogen on site yourself. So, okay, so that sounds good. So are there different ways that um, nitrogen, do you guys have different types of nitrogen generators? Yeah, there's two, two different ways to make nitrogen uh, at your facility. One is 
called PSA or pressure swing adsorption. And that uses uh, two towers filled with this special carbon molecular sieve. And uh, carbon molecular sieve is like the uh, small granules of an extended surface media. And that media holds oxygen at high pressure and releases it at low pressure. So by cycling, by, by running air through it and cycling between high and low pressure, you can um, capture, the, uh, capture the oxygen, leave the, leave the nitrogen behind, but then regenerate the bed by reducing the pressure and releasing that oxygen to a waste stream. Okay. Other method, uh, the other method is uh, technology that uh, uh, has been around probably. PSA has been, both of these technologies have been around for about 30 or 40 years. The other method, which is, has uh, advanced much more uh, rapidly, is a membrane, hollow fiber membrane technology. Okay. These are um, fairly high tech, uh, let's call them drinking straws. So if you look at a drinking straw, the air is passing down the center bore of the drinking straw. Okay. Oxygen permeates out of the walls because oxygen uh, has better permeation uh, rate through, the, through a very thin skin on the outside of this membrane. And that allows you to get uh, nitrogen uh, downstream at pressure. Okay. So we've got the pressure swing absorption where the carbon molecules are basically trapping your nitrogen or oxygen, and then the membrane where you're, you're passing through that, that membrane or that drinking straw as you go through. That, that makes sense. So what, are, what is the difference? When would you use a pressure swing versus a membrane and, and vice versa? Well, you, you want to look at it from a uh, capital cost and energy usage. Really, the, the crossover point of when you would use one versus the other comes down to the purity of nitrogen. Okay. Now, a lot of people, if you're buying cryogenic nitrogen, you're really overpaying for, for, for high purity nitrogen. A lot of applications don't need that purity. But, for example, PSA, typically you want to have at a, at a point that it's greater than 98% um, pure nitrogen. Membranes work really well at up to about 98% sometimes 99% purity. The other thing is that uh, membranes are very interesting in, in that you do not need, need electricity. Um, they're small, smaller than a comp comparable PSA system, and they're lighter weight. So if your application requires small size, no electricity, like, at a, uh, like an oil and gas facility where you have a class one div, uh, a div two area, um, explosion proof area, you might want to use membrane technology instead. So there's a few different things to, uh, to take into consideration. Okay, that makes sense. And what kind of purity would somebody get out of the cryogenic just as a reference? Is this 99 point, a, a couple nines, or what are we talking about there? Usually when you get liquid nitrogen in a doer, and a doer is about uh, one of these portable tanks, if it's on wheels, uh, that's typically around 99.9%. .9%. If you okay. get it in a pressure cylinder, you can get it as pure as you want, but that takes additional purification steps uh, and additional energy to actually make that level of nitrogen. Okay, gotcha. And so I think you kind of touched on this, but um, is there's no electricity with a membrane required, right? It's just you put in compressed air and out you get... Uh, nitrogen and uh, you're exhausting oxygen. Right. The only electricity needed, and it can be located remotely, is from is to power the compressor. Okay. Where the membrane is located, uh, that can be in an area where there, there is no need to run electricity or have an electrician come in and supply electricity. So I think you've you've kind of given us a few reasons, but. What are the reasons, I guess, somebody would use a nitrogen generator? You've, you've touched on it, but um, kind of rolled up all these. this info you're given. Kind of, if I'm yeah. looking at a nitrogen generator, why, why would I say this is what I want? Well, you know, the, the paradigm really is to you know, call up a gas company and, and get your nitrogen delivered. 
Uh, but yeah. that's really that that technology is, believe it or not, over 120 years old. Wow! That you're relying on that air separation technology. It's been an, it's been developed since uh, since then, uh, since the late uh, 18th century. <clears throat> but really, the modern way of generating nitrogen really should be on site, you know, on site in your factory. There's a few reasons for that. One is to save money. Nitrogen generators typically have a two-year or less payback. Uh, the second reason is that it's convenient. You never run out of gas. Um, there's no no um, fear that you know if, they, if you're having a snow terrible snowstorm and the trucks are off the road, you're going to run out of nitrogen. That's not going to happen if you have a nitrogen generator. You are uh, self-reliant. You're not relying on an outside uh, supplier to deliver that. Yeah, it seems a little easier, you know, dealing with paperwork or delivery truck drivers and uh, scheduling, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, there's safety. You're, you're operating at a low pressure. There's no heavy cylinders that have to be moved, moved, moved around. In fact, uh, if you've ever watched the Myth, Mythbusters, they did a, uh, a, a great Mythbuster episode where they sheared off the top of a high-pressure gas cylinder. And it acted just the way everybody says it would. It was a torpedo. It went through a 12-inch uh, thick cinder block wall. I saw that, yeah. Actually moved it about two inches. It's a great, uh, it's a great uh, video to watch on YouTube. Um, and, it, it, you know, like I said before, it does have a greener impact on the environment. There's one thing that's not often thought about. When you have a nitrogen generator, if you want to add an extra shift, you don't have to buy another nitrogen generator. Because you're generating it on demand. So mm. if demand increases due to the number of hours in a day, you're not adding an extra nitrogen generator. Whereas if you, ha if you are relying on bulk delivery of gases, you have to buy more, more gases. So there's a, there's a, there's a uh, I mean, you're kind of caught in a quandary if you're relying on delivered nitrogen, and that you have to get more nitrogen to add more work hours. Yeah. I you know, that's that's nice because I know I think some places parts of the year they work uh, a couple shifts and other parts of the year they may only work one shift. So this is an easy way to scale up and scale back down as as demand increases and decreases. Correct. That's cool. So um, a lot of good reasons. That sounds like a great technology. There, I have to mention that there are some opportunities, some uh, applications where a nitrogen generator does not make sense. Um, if you're doing freezing or if you're relying on the cold temperature of liquid nitrogen, mm. like freezing of vegetables or fish, certainly a nitrogen generator is not, is not an option there. Also, if you're only using nitrogen occasionally, like one cylinder a month or something like that, certainly a nitrogen generator isn't, isn't going to make sense for you. But okay. nitrogen is an important part of your process, gaseous nitrogen, like the, you know, storing food. A packaging food rather or coffee, then it makes sense to go with the nitrogen generator. Okay, so this this makes sense. It's the kind of thing that you're going to want uh, an expert to come out and take a look at your overall situation and say, "Hey, this is a good fit for nitrogen. Here's the one you need," or "This isn't a good fit at all," or "Hey, you know, you're on the borderline for a couple things. Um, maybe we've got to review this or look a little deeper." That makes sense. Well, Dave. Thanks a lot. Again, everybody, Dave Connaughton from Parker Ballston. Um, good overview of nitrogen generators. And thank you, everybody, for listening to Brenner Fiedler's This Automation Life. If you have any questions about what you've just heard or if you have a topic that you'd like to hear discussed, please email us at tech at brfa.com. That's T-E-C-H at brfa.com. And be sure to continue tuning in each week. 